And on that note, where were the fire extinguishers that were stored inside the capsule cabin? And why were the wires stripped of their fireproofing? As Kennan and Harvey write on page 57 of Mission to the Moon, the review board therefore included the history of a similar spacecraft, Command Module 008, whose altitude testing was presumed to be typical of all Apollo spacecraft. It is of the greatest significance that two fire extinguishers were located in that 008 spacecraft during its testing. Not only were fire extinguishers included, but fire-resistant Teflon sheets and fireproof beta cloth were draped over wire bundles in the astronauts' couches. These particular items, non-flight items, were conspicuously absent in Command Module 012 during the fatal Plugs Out test on January 27, 1967. Given that the Apollo 1 capsule did indeed have fire extinguishers installed, why did Frank Borman testify before Congress that the closest thing the crew had to a fire extinguisher was the tiny water gun used to liquefy foods? We are very aware of the fires at Johnsville Navy Air Station, and also at Brooks Air Force Base. We came to the conclusion that the best available fire extinguisher that we had on board was our water pistol, and these were the plans that we used. Although fire extinguishers had previously been carried in Spacecraft 008, and NASA's own tests confirmed the dangers of pure oxygen, on page 185 of Leap of Faith, Gordon Cooper goes on to say, there was no fire extinguisher in Apollo, a tragic oversight. One top administrator at NASA was opposed to having a fire extinguisher aboard our spacecraft. He thought the chances for a fire in space were minuscule and not worth the extra weight of the fire extinguishers. It's easy in hindsight to say what was needed. We were all guilty of not pushing for them hard enough. As a result of the accident, water extinguishers were placed aboard Apollo. Even though we conducted tests that proved halon extinguishers, chemically rendered combustion impossible instantly. On page 138 of Heroes in Space, Peter Bond writes, No danger was anticipated, for the rocket was empty of fuel, so the fire crews were on standby rather than maximum alert. The fuels used on the Saturn 1B were liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Oxygen was the same element used in both the rocket stages for propulsion and in the capsule cabin for breathing. Whether liquid or gaseous, pure oxygen is downright flammable. How could anyone possibly place the firemen on standby, not full alert, knowing full well the fire hazard posed by pure oxygen? So basically speaking, they did everything wrong like they were morons. And I don't think they were morons, I think they were trying to kill these three guys. They, they didn't want the other two, they just wanted to grisp Grissom. Because he was threatening to go public. Apparently, Grissom had already gone to the press and told them his thoughts on the Moon Project. He made the front page of the March 11, 1966, Southern Illinoisian. Astronaut Virgil Grissom says computers predict that only one of the first three manned U.S. attempts to land on the moon will be successful. But he told the news conference here that human judgment would likely prove the computers wrong. He said the computers had predicted the loss of two of the seven astronauts in the Mercury program, but none was killed. As for the moonshots, he said the computer estimate did not mean the crews would necessarily be lost. He did not elaborate but he probably meant the spacecraft would, for some reason, fail to land on the moon. It seems that Gus Grissom was very concerned about the shape of his spacecraft. In October 1966, he and Joe Shea were having a discussion about it. Shea was the project manager for the Apollo spacecraft. In a 1998 interview, Joe Shea had this to say. Well, fire was always a concern mm -hmm. at the acceptance test for the spacecraft. We had a discussion, Grissom brought it up initially, mm -hmm. about there being too much Velcro and too much other stuff around. Mm -hmm. The fire rule was that anything that might 
respond to a spark and start a fire should be it was four four inches in mercury I think and it was like 10 or 11, 10 and a half inches in Apollo. North America would have spot the crew like to like um, they'd like to uh, customize the spacecraft mm -hmm. and they they would put Velcro wherever they wanted. Nobody was checking on it. And they had this other thing called Rochelle netting where they'd put their books and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so the issue was brought up at the acceptance of the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. A long drawn out discussion I got a little annoyed and I said, look, there's no way there's going to be a fire on a spacecraft unless the astronauts, unless there's a spark where the astronauts bring cigarettes aboard, we're not going to let them smoke. Mm -hmm. Well, I then issued orders at that meeting, go clean up the spacecraft, be sure that all the fire orders are, fire rules are obeyed. Mm -hmm. And to whom That was in, in like October. Uh -huh. The fire was what, January or something? Mm -hmm. The North American was a slow contractor. Mm -hmm. Their response to that direction, which we gave them that the Monday after the spacecraft was delivered, response to that direction got to the Cape mm -hmm. the day of the fire, and of course they never had work, time to work on it. They never worked on it. Mm -hmm. So the fire happened. And and I got removed for, for reasons I don't understand from the uh, program manager position. Mm -hmm. I didn't stay with NASA very long after that. Mm -hmm. North American Aviation had this to say about Velcro. Grissom was an Air Force pilot and developed certain Air Force habits. He wanted his flight plan stowed in a particular place, the same with his pen and the rest of his personal gear. But as an astronaut, he had developed an aversion to seeing his personal stuff drift before his eyes in the weightlessness of space. Fortunately, there was Velcro, the hairy new miracle fabric that stuck to itself. Put a little tab of Velcro on the bulkhead and another little tab on the pen, and voila! A place for everything and everything in its place. Naturally, Chaffee and White added their personal touches as well. And soon the astronauts had managed to cover the bulkheads with Velcro, but Velcro was flammable, and concern about flammability was one of the things that came up during the acceptance review on August 19th. I can't help but notice some slip-ups between these two testimonies. If Grissom was extremely worried about the amount of Velcro in the spacecraft, as Shay initially stated, why would he be carelessly putting Velcro everywhere, knowing the fire risk it posed? Interestingly, when talking about the meeting, when Grissom brought the fires to attention, Michael Gray goes on to write, At one point, someone brought up the fact that Velcro was a potential fire hazard, but it was a six-hour meeting, and among the hundreds of items on the agenda, nobody on Earth could have given the fact the attention that history would soon accord it. Gee, in spite of the rigorous six-hour meeting, Joe Shea was able to remember that that somebody was Grissom himself. Again, why would Grissom plaster the entire capsule interior with Velcro if he were concerned about the fire hazard? I can't help but sense either NASA or North American, or both, playing the little old game of blame the dead guy so you can save yourself. It was the other three, not me. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on, it really was the other three. <laughs> 
Now, normally Velcro is not much of a fire risk. This is Velcro in air at sea level. Under intense direct heat, it'll burn, it'll melt, it will not support combustion. Now this is Velcro in an atmosphere of 100% oxygen. Other flammable materials included nylon and also foam rubber cushions, which were found welded to white spacesuit. According to the authors of Mission to the Moon, it was the first time that these were put inside the cockpit. Not only were these items flammable, they were also toxic and can release poisons such as cyanide and carbon monoxide into the air. It was later established during the autopsies that the fire had breached their suits and the astronauts had died from poisonous smoke inhalation. But according to the New York Times, the astronauts were almost completely destroyed by the fire, little more than their bones remained. This is exactly what happens when a dead body is cremated. Well, what you end up with is, you've got to understand you end up with just bones, uh -huh. uh, and then the ashes, are, the bones, are, sorry, the bones are taken out of the retort and put into an ash processing machine, which crushes them and reduces them to the ash, as we, as we call it. The equipment is designed to totally consume the coffin. Consume the coffin. There's, there's no um, coffin ash. It, it works. It's a, the way the equipment works, it, it burns it over and brings it back into the chamber, the gases back into the chamber again and burns them again until uh, the coffin is uh, consumed totally. So Except for nails, they, they don't melt at all. The actual ash. The actual ash that you get in the urns is just the skeleton. Because all, all the wood and um, all the handles and everything like that on the coffins, they just go, they just disintegrate because of the heat. Ralph Rene often referred to this disaster as the Apollo 1 cremation. My point is, if the astronaut's flesh had been consumed by the fire, how could doctors possibly have determined that they died of smoke inhalation? René shared the same doubts that it was the poisons that killed them. As he told me in a personal email, an oxygen fire burns out your lungs the instant you exhale or speak. The man who flew with Gus Grissom on his return to space was astronaut John Young. When interviewed for Ron Evans' documentary, In the Shadow of the Moon, Young said this about the Apollo 1 spacecraft. And the wires were really bad in there. I'd ask, I'd ask Gus, I said, Gus, why don't you say something about this wiring? I said, it's really terrible. I ought to do something about this wiring. It's really bad. And he said, I don't. And he said, I can't say anything about it or they'll fire me. And that's what he told me. I couldn't believe it. What a coincidence that shortly after bringing his findings to attention that Thomas Ronald Barron, a North American aviation employee, was fired. It seems in Grissom's case they fired him quite literally. Grissom had his own way of making sure the world knew how he felt about the capsule. According to NASA's website, on January 22nd, 1967, Grissom made a brief stop at home before returning to the Cape. A citrus tree grew in their backyard with lemons on it as big as grapefruits. Gus yanked the largest lemon he could find off the tree. Betty had no idea what he was up to and asked what he planned to do with the lemon. I'm going to hang it on that spacecraft, Gus said grimly and kissed her goodbye. Betty knew that Gus would be unable to return home before the crew conducted the plugs out test on January 27th, 1967. 
What she did not know was that January 22nd would be the last time he was here at the house. It's important to note that this confirmation that Grissom did indeed hang a lemon on the spacecraft came straight from NASA's website.